AP Biology, Chapter 41, Animal Nutrition, Part 2. Vitamins and Minerals. Vitamins are also called coenzymes. Minerals are also called cofactors. Both vitamins and minerals, coenzymes and cofactors, are used to help proteins to fold. The big difference between a coenzyme, a vitamin, and a cofactor, a mineral, is whether or not they're organic. Coenzymes are organic, and if you remember, organic means it has a carbon backbone. So if you can think of anything with carbon in it, like glucose, uh, that's an organic molecule because it has carbon that functional groups are stuck to. Cofactors, also called minerals, are inorganic, and they look like um, things off a periodic table, things like iron, iodine, calcium. Uh, so these are not organic, but they also help proteins to fold. We're going to need to write down both of these. Uh, now, there's more than just these vitamins and minerals. However, these are the ones I want you to know. Vitamin B1 is water-soluble. That means if you get an overdose of any water-soluble vitamin, you'll just pee out or urinate out the excess. Now, that's okay. So let's say you really want to take a lot of vitamin C to try to uh, shorten the duration of a cold. Well, it's probably not going to do you any real harm unless you got a, a ton of vitamin C because it'll just uh, uh, excrete the extra out. However, fat soluble means that uh, it's not um, excreted out. So what happens in a overdose of vitamin A or vitamin D is that you actually store it in your tissues. And if you get more vitamin A, more vitamin D, it'll keep on accumulating within the body tissues. And that could actually cause some serious problems. So that's something you should know. Uh, vitamins, uh, there's water soluble and fat soluble. And the fat soluble are the ones that um, you could have a problem with if you accumulate too much of it in your body. You don't get rid of it easily. All right, so vitamin B1, um, this uh, will result in a deficient, if you are deficient in vitamin B1, you get a disease called beriberi, and that's a nervous system disorder where you start to have uh, uh, shakes and things like that. So as you can tell, probably vitamin B1 has something to do with the nervous system. Vitamin C is um, used for making skin and uh, some other stuff. What happens if you are deficient in vitamin C? is you get something called scurvy. So you might have heard in like pirate movies, argue scurvy dogs. Well, this is what they're talking about. A lot of people on uh, sailing ships used to uh, die from scurvy. And the reason why is that back in the olden times, they didn't take uh, uh, citrus fruits, which are high in vitamin C on long ocean voyages, so that sailors uh, consisting on salted meat and uh, biscuits and water, as well as uh, rum, uh, didn't get enough vitamin C in their diet and got a lot of scurvy. And what happens is your skin starts to pull away from your uh, underlying layers and your teeth start to bleed and you have poor wound healing and all kinds of other stuff. So scurvy is a pretty serious condition. In fact, it was in the 1800s that a British sailor uh, traveling to South America picked up citrus fruit uh, just as part of their supplies and uh, noticed that uh, crew was not getting scurvy and that uh, ship's captain... Um, conveyed this to the Admiralty, and um, eventually all the uh, British sailors uh, were given vitamin C in the form of citrus fruits, things like limes and lemons. Because the British Navy was the only Navy at the time in the 1800s to have limes and other things on board, they were given a nickname. British sailors still have that nickname sometimes. Uh, they are called limeys, and the whole reason why was to avoid scurvy back in the old days. Vitamin A. Um, vitamin A is found in carrots and green leafy vegetables. It's fat soluble. Deficiency leads to vision problems. Now, if you eat a lot of carrots, that doesn't mean you're going to have super vision. You just prevent vision problems. So keep that in mind. Vitamin D. Uh, we make vitamin D in our skin uh, when the sun hits it. We also fortify our milk with vitamin D. And a deficiency is called rickets. Vitamin D helps with uh, metabolizing calcium. And uh, if you don't get enough of vitamin D, you get rickets and bone deformities. All right, cofactors. The cofactors I want you to know are iron, iodine, and calcium. An iron deficiency uh, results in anemia. And anemia basically means you're tired and you're not transporting like things like oxygen uh, through your body. But anemia is a general condition. It's not just caused by iron deficiency. However, you need iron in order to make hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein in your red blood cells that carries oxygen. We'll talk more about that in Chapter 42. And the, um, if you can't make hemoglobin, you can't carry oxygen. You need oxygen for cell respiration for energy. So if you're deficient in iron, you may feel tired because you're not doing as much cell respiration. 
iodine. Uh, iodine is used for some of the hormones made by the thyroid, and if you don't get enough iodine, the thyroid enlarges and forms a goiter that you'll see in a future slide here. Calcium, uh, you probably heard of calcium before. That's found in milk as well. Calcium um, deficiency leads to bone deformities, and uh, especially uh, older people and especially old women need to build up a lot of calcium during their lifetimes in order to uh, avoid breaking down those calcium deposits in their bones uh, when they get older. So uh, once you're older, you start breaking down some of that, the bone for some of the, the calcium. And if that happens and you didn't build up a, a lot during your lifetime, you could have a lot more issues like broken hips and such. All right, so these are the vitamins you should uh, write down and minerals. Remember, they both help proteins to fold. Now, here's uh, all the vitamins, and you don't have to know all these, but uh, this is something I just wanted to show you. You know, we have uh, thiamine, which was that vitamin B1, but if you're interested, here's some more. Here we have the fat-soluble vitamins. You don't have to know all those. Coenzymes are organic, and they help proteins to fold. All right, review this. Don't have to worry about vitamin E. A, E, and D are fat-soluble. C and B are water-soluble. And the water-soluble, it's harder to overdose on because you just excrete the excess. All right, here's some of the minerals. And again, we only need to know three of these, but I want to show you all of them. Cofactors are inorganic, and they also help proteins to fold. All right, dietary regimes. All animals eat other organisms. Herbivores eat autotrophs, plants, algae. Gorillas, uh, you know, you probably see a gorilla with a banana. Cows eat grass, hares eat grass. Snails eating plants. Carnivores, carne means meat, and uh, eating other animals, of course, sharks. Hawks, spiders, snakes. This is kind of a review of some of the stuff from uh, first quarter. So if you feel like you need to write this down, you can, but uh, you don't have to if you know this. Omni means all, so omnivores eat everything. Well, not literally, but they can eat pl ants, plants and uh, animals. Things like cockroaches, bears, raccoons, humans, uh, even uh, mice are omnivores technically. Human evolved as hunters, scavengers, and gatherers. And of course, once we uh, invented agriculture, uh, we were able to stay in one place and uh, provide ourselves a steady food supply for civilization to occur. All right, here's some feeding adaptations. You should be familiar with these. Uh, so you can write down all four of these and just kind of jot yourself a quick note on it if you, uh, if you don't think you'll remember it. Suspension feeding. feeding. Basically, we have uh, things like krill, tiny shrimp-like creatures suspended in the water. Uh, we have modified teeth called baleen. They're like long uh, filters inside the uh, blue whale. And as the blue whale swims through the water, it filters out the krill. It's the largest animal on this planet, eating one of the smallest animals. So that's called suspension feeding. They're just kind of filtering all the goodies out of the water. Substrate feeding, we're uh, eating the uh, center of a leaf. That's basically the, uh, the substrate that they're, they're uh, working on. Fluid feeding, uh, these are the female mosquitoes. Male mosquitoes don't uh, suck blood. Normally they drink nectar. However, during the baby making time of the mosquito's life cycle, when they need uh, extra proteins to make their, their little eggs, they get the extra protein from you. And bulk feeding, you could just digest the entire organism without chewing. Basically, we can unhinge the lower jaw on this um, uh, boa constrictor and uh, take the whole thing in. Once that whole uh, animal's in the body, it'll take weeks before it's digested, and uh, it won't be moving much while it's digesting. All right, now this is def definitely something you need to know, so let's go and write this down. We have four processes with food processing. The first step is ingestion, or taking stuff in. That's an easy one to remember. It's basically just eating. The second step is digestion, and there's two types of digestion that we're going to talk about, mechanical versus and, um, chemical digestion. Breaking food down small enough into molecules the body can absorb. So that's what digestion is all about. If we're breaking down your uh, potato starch into sugars, simple sugars, that's digestion. We also have something called enzymatic hydrolysis that we talked about in previous uh, classes. Enzymes carry out chemical reactions. They lower the activation energy. 
hydrolysis. Remember, that's breaking apart stuff using water. Lysis means break apart. So we're going to be using a whole bunch of enzymes, many secreted by your pancreas, in order to digest chemically the food with enzymes. You also mechanically digest by chewing. And that churning and breaking up of food increases surface area for more enzymes to act on it. Absorption, which is different from digestion, is actually taking up the uh, cells of the, um, the broken down food. And then elimination, anything that is not uh, used passes out through the digestive system and exits the other, the other end. Now these are two uh, simpler types of digestion. Uh, before we go into animal digestion, remember that uh, ex we have this gastrovascular cavity and things like hydra, and uh, they have a single opening for their mouth and anus. Basically it's an uh, uh, incomplete digestive system. And this uh, organism only has like two layers of cells, so there's no transportation of nutrients. It just digests the food and absorbs directly into the cells. However, um, it's, there's no complicated uh, structures within the hydra for processing their little uh, meals. And that's a daphnia, it's not a bird. Intracellular digestion, intra means inside, so single-celled organisms like paramecium just um, take in food particles, engulf them in a little membrane-bound sac, and then enzymes fuse with the membrane, things like lysosomes, to break it down even further. So that's intracellular, within the cells, extracellular, outside the cell digestion. Animals do extracellular digestion, but some simple single-celled organisms can do intracellular digestion. All right, review these terms. All right, now this is a review of some of the stuff we talked about in a previous class. Remember, this is called a complete digestive system. We have an in-hole and an out-hole. So basically all digestive systems of animals that are fairly complex are a tube. Even our body is basically a modified tube, with the entrance of that tube being at your mouth, and of course the other uh, opening being at the other end of your body, the anus. Over here we have the uh, different parts of the worm digestive system. The only one I really want to point out is the gizzard. You should know what the gizzard does. Uh, birds don't have teeth to chew their food, neither do worms. When uh, birds eat a, a meal, what they'll do is they also eat some pebbles, and those pebbles end up in the gizzard. Uh, as the smooth muscle, remember smooth muscle is unstriated, not striated, and uh, not branched. As this uh, smooth muscle churns with the rocks inside, it grinds up whatever's in the gizzard. So that's kind of their method of chewing, and that's what the gizzard does. And the same thing happens with uh, uh, these little worms, except they have like sand-sized particles in their gizzard. It's elementary, dear Watson. Elementary uh, refers to the um, digestive system. Peri means around, stulsis. So peristalsis are rhythmic waves of contraction by smooth muscles in the walls of the digestive system pushing food along. Kind of imagine it as like a tube of toothpaste with your uh, esophagus kind of pushing that food down in a rhythmic push from uh, mouth all the way down to, uh, um, well, all the way out until it leaves your body. So peristalsis is a rhythmic contraction of pushing of food from one end to the other. Women also do this when they're giving birth. Peristalsis will result in a, um, a pushing of the child out of the, the uterus. Sphincters are muscle ring-like valves that are not attached to any uh, bone, uh, but they are made of muscle, uh, well, in this case, they're made of smooth muscle. They uh, regulate the passage of material between specialized chambers of the canal. So think of them as like a doorway to the next part of the digestive system. This is the role of sphincters, and we'll talk about those as we get to them. Then we have some accessory glands, things that help with digestion, secrete digestive juices, water, and uh, things, enzymes mixed in with it. Salivary glands secrete uh, the enzyme salivary amylase that we're going to get into. Pancreas is the major organ for digestion. This is going to release a lot of enzymes to break down your food. And then the liver and gallbladder that we'll talk about for fats. All right, here's the human digestive system. Again, it's just one big tube exposed to the external environment, starting hole, ending hole. So what we have here is the uh, salivary glands. We've got the pharynx here, which is a common tube for both the air and food. Then the pharynx will branch off into the trachea and esophagus. The esophagus is part of the digestive system. The trachea is part of the respiratory system. Esophagus, peristalsis, push, 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 push. The food all the way down to the stomach. Uh, stomach is going to not be the major point of, of digestion. That's going to be the small intestine. 
food leaves there, it leaves through a sphincter. You can see we have two sphincters here. This pyloric sphincter separates the stomach from the intestine. We have three parts of the intestine. Uh, we're going to go through those three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Again, we'll write this stuff down later. Don't write anything down now. Uh, eventually, the food will go through all the small intestine. This is where all, almost a, a good portion, most of the digestion and absorption into the bloodstream occurs. By the time the food exits the small intestine, it's really been turned into feces. It's, it's pretty close to like watery feces. So at this point, we enter the large intestine. And here's the junction. The large intestine's main role is to absorb water back into the body, reclaim some of that water. You're going to secrete a lot of water uh, during digestion. Remember, hydrolysis needs water in order to break apart molecules. So you're going to need that water to digest your food. We have uh, appendix. Uh, remember, this is a vestigial structure. And sometimes bacteria get trapped inside there. And when they do get trapped, then the bacteria multiply and build up gases. And it becomes really painful. And then if the appendix bursts, the bacteria can kind of seep out into the, outs uh, the internal environment of the body. And uh, that could be uh, life-threatening. So they have to cut that out. It's always on the same side, too. So if you feel sharp pain on your right side toward the lower right side, then uh, you might have appendicitis. Then by the time the uh, food reaches the, uh, the end here, we've pulled out the water, the feces are fairly solid, and then we get rid of the rest with elimination. All right, you can read this. All right, first step, swallowing. So the first step is the mouth ingests the food, uh, ingestion, and it's the only place where ingestion is involved. There is uh, something you should know, though, at this point. We have mechanical digestion. This is the starting point of mechanical digestion. Mechanical means physically breaking apart the stuff, not chemically. So when you chew your food, that's mechanical digestion. You might want to put that in parentheses as you're writing this down, chewing the food. And why do you choose the food? It's to increase surface area. More surface area, more places where the enzymes can break down the, uh, the food you ate. Chemical digestion also starts in the mouth, but only of starch. Starch is a polymer of um, chains of sugars. So what you do in the mouth is break down starch into sugars using the enzyme called salivary amylase. And this enzyme will break it into sugars. So both chemical and mechanical digestion starts in the mouth. Epiglottis closes the trachea when swallowing. If you take a look here, we have the epiglottis up. This tube right here is the pharynx. This little blob of food is called a bolus of food, a chewed up mass of food. As the food moves down the throat, this little epiglottis here, do you see it? It's going to close. So what happens is the food goes down the esophagus when the epiglottis closes and not down the trachea, otherwise you'll choke. Epi means on top of, on top of and glottis is what this little area is. So epiglottis is on top of the glottis. As the food moves down the uh, pharynx, it'll enter the esophagus, and then you can kind of see these rhythmic contraction of peristalsis, you have to know that, pushing the food down into the stomach. All right, this ends part two of your notes on chapter 41, Digestive System.